great to be here with Scott McDonald, who's currently playing and coaching over in his homeland in Brisbane Road. Hi there, Scott. Good, thanks, Donald. How are you? Very well. I'm sure it's a little bit warmer over there than it is in Inverness, anyway. Indeed, mate. <laughs> I was up at seven o'clock this morning, um, taking one of our juniors at, at Brisbane Roy. He wanted a little bit of extra work, and sun was splitting the pavement. Donald, it was oh. about nineteen degrees. Just, oh. just up for a, a twenty-eight degrees day. So, uh, oh, can't complain, mate. <laughs> and because I suppose it's coming to be summer there now, is it? Yeah, yeah it is. Um, you know, Brisbane's quite. Uh, Queensland itself can get yeah. really, really hot. I signed here in the January time, mm. and. Uh, the humidity just was through the roof. Uh, I mean, I come on last 20 minutes of my first game and yeah. I almost fainted. You know, yeah. it was that hot and that humid. It just takes a good while to obviously acclimatise. But yeah. thankfully now I'm getting there. Um, but can't complain. It's, a, it's an absolute joy to, to be involved and in, to play at this club, but also to live in, you know, the, yeah. the type of place we're living in now. It's uh, It's been fantastic for the family, you know, coming sure. from... Uh, Sunny Glasgow, so, as I know. I know. Um, all the way back home. Um, this is pretty much, you know, the reason why we came, and, and we're really enjoying the outdoor lifestyle that we're able to have here. I'm sure that sounds great, Scott. So, how did you, you know, as a kid, how did you get into football? Oh well, it's pretty simple, really, Donald. Um, yeah. You know, both my parents are from Scotland, both yeah. from Glasgow. Yeah. Uh, Mum was born and raised in Govan. Yeah. Dad was. Uh, dad was uh, born in Castlemilk, yeah. so just on the outskirts of Glasgow. Um, and really, from the day I was born, the first thing I was bought was a, a soft teddy sort of football. So right. uh, that got some good use over the years. I'm uh, sure. I, until I think my, I think my mum threw it out in the end. She was so sick of me breaking things <laughs> with everything else. You know, I was just talking to one of my brothers about it the other day, and. God, the, the amount of ornaments and, and windows that we broke yeah. over, over the years. I'm sure every every boy has its tail, you know, with I that. Know. even though different. And so it really started at a very young age for me. Yeah. Um, and I started playing for a football team when I was, you know, as young as five years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember going out for my first game, and I've said this before, where everyone started laughing at me. And I, at five-year-old, you shouldn't really be that conscious of it, but I was. I actually still remember it. Um, but it wasn't until I come off and mum and dad were talking about it. I just remember them talking about it. I never asked about it because you're not old enough at that point, but it's because my shorts were basically down to my ankles. They couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't get <laughs> to fit me. So there were these baggy things. You couldn't see my legs. So that's what they were <laughs> Funny enough, that happened throughout my career. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. I know. So that area of Australia where you're from, was there a lot of competition, you know, with – is it a, a football area? There's, I know rugby league's big there as well. It's, you know, it's, a, it's great to grow up, as you said earlier, in the outdoors and, and, and the climate. How popular was football in your area? Uh, it probably was only, I only realised it was popular, or I thought it was, because of the community that we were in. Like the, the, the soccer clubs or football clubs, yeah. as we call it, were, were social clubs. Yeah. So a lot of the these places in the in the seventies and eighties, even probably before that time, were you know places where all the expats or if you were Croatian, you would go to your Croatian club or Italian or Greek, you know, huge Greek community in Melbourne, um, and and that's how these football clubs were born, you know, through mm-hmm. the social side. So um, you spend your whole weekends there. You, you were spending more or less your whole life at these places. Um, funny enough, my mum and dad actually got married. At, um, at the club we, we I, my dad played for, I played for, my brothers played for, you know, so it's kind of crazy. I think they met at that club. Mm-hmm. So um, it just showed you how far back it goes and, and what these clubs were. But you mentioned about all different sports. Uh, you know, Melbourne's predominantly AFL. Um, it's It used to be called the VFL because yeah. Victoria, that, that's where it was only played. Yeah. It's branched out now Australia-wide. Um, but that was it. You know, the AFL was the biggest was thing. It? And then you had cricket. You had cricket in the summer. Yeah. But um, I was lucky enough to, to play all ball sports. And I think that really enhanced, uh, you know, my hand-eye coordination, yeah. uh, my competitiveness and, and edge that all good Australians seem to have, or at that point anyway, had, you know, growing up, you know, it was win or die. You know, that yeah. was that was just the attitude of the Aussies, you know, win at all yeah. costs. And, uh, 
you know, some will say that that's not a good thing, but I guess when you're brought up with it, like I was, it wasn't really an issue. It was just the way it was. And, and, and that's how you played. You played to win. It's interesting, and even coming away from you know football, and you know I I love tennis as well. Growing up, my mother was a great tennis fan, and I ended up living. I seen in your CV, I ended up living in Wimbledon as well for years. And my mom always used to tell me, says she she said the Aussies were so tough. You know, it was in the area in the era of Lever and John Newcomb and that. Says never say die. Where do you where do you think that comes from, Scott? I think it's just a, an upbringing, a culture, uh, an environment within the Australian uh, culture. I can't really put my finger on it, you know, because you're born into it almost. Yeah. I was certainly born into that that, that type of culture um, being in Australia. You know, I wouldn't necessarily say it was just from my parents. My parents never put pressure on me. But I think the environments that you, you become within, you know, whether it's school or you know, school competitions uh, out with that, uh, it grows on you. And and I think back then there wasn't as much thought process about um, everyone's a winner or everyone's, you know, seen as equal and we have to keep the interest bubbling for everyone. It was the winners here and the rest yeah. there type of attitude. It was like, you know, the winners survive and the losers, you know, we forget about it. And I'm not saying that that was the right thing, but we certainly – were brought up that way, and yeah. um, I think the ones that survive were certainly, you know, more than survivors and winners. Yeah. Um, and something that I, mean, I think culturally all around the world, I'm not saying Australia's the only, you know, nation to have done that, um, but we've slightly, slowly edged away from that. Um, and I think we can even see from uh, the Olympics um, just how far Australia have sort of gone down the slopes since Sydney 2000, uh, yeah. whether that's to do also with government funding, I think um, most certainly is. I know we're going off track, but... Yeah, no, um, that's interesting. Yeah, but certainly um, w within Australia, that type of, you know, win at all costs has certainly lost its sort of way, I think. And I think it's even showing probably with the amount of Australians that we have playing you know, football in Europe now, um, very few and far between. Uh, maybe that's got something to do with now we've got a professional league here, so a lot of the players stay a lot uh, to a lot older and become more comfortable, whereas when I was younger and the likes of the Harry Kules and Mark Vadukas, you had to go out. You had to go abroad if you wanted to be a success, you know, whereas you get it here now. Um, yeah. But some to that point where they, they get to that age where it gets too late for them then to, to move forward and, and go overseas and the interest sort of dies because... We know it's a it's a business. So from a financial game for these you know big professional clubs in Europe, they, they, they'll look past you know a, a twenty four year old in Australia. Yeah, and when you because we talk about that grittiness of growing up and and you know that you know you have to be a winner actually to survive and get to the top. Do you think that helped you in the move that you made from Australia to come over to the UK? That you know that drive and and wanting to make it. I've often thought about that, Donald, in terms of, um, you know, could I have been different? I was very hard to, to handle, yeah. <laughs> I must say. Yeah. I, look back, I look back on myself and like now that we get older, you do reflect a lot more. And I, <laughs> if you asked any of my coaches, <laughs> they'd think I was an absolute nightmare. Yeah. And, you know, even when I was, you know, even a teenager growing up, I was so demanding. Um, I was fortunate. I, I think I... One of our local teams when I was 14, we managed to, to go around and, and raise enough money to actually come to Scotland and um, mm -hmm. play in the Aberdeen International Football Festival and the Ayrshire Cup. From those experiences, it really made uh, me realise and open my eyes about what competition was out there. You know, we were playing top teams from Ghana, the teams from England, Scotland, uh, Spartak Moscow, who were, were just unbelievable at the tournament. And you're thinking, wow. This is uh, this is real stuff, you know. Um, we think we're good over in Australia. We've just realised we're in the real world here. So, it made you work harder. Um, and I think that confidence and determination that I had, I needed that. I needed that sense of a little bit of oh, probably Aussies are cocky, aren't they? They say that cockiness. Um, when I went over to you know Southampton when I signed there, I'd had a, a good upbringing in Australia, a good education in football, um, played for the the youth teams. And we done really well. And through that, that's how I got my break to, to come overseas. But 
you know, it's always tough when you come to the UK or anywhere in Europe because you're foreseen as taking one of the local lads' places. Mm. So um, you've got to be strong-minded, thick-skinned, and be ready for the challenge because you're not just trying to prove it to the coaches. It's all your teammates as well. And I remember one of the – he's still my friend now, actually. Brian Howard, his name is uh, – came through the same youth team and he was tapped me on the shoulder like two days in and went, just be careful, you, you know, the, the coach and everyone's told everyone to basically kick lumps out here. So be ready. You know, and me being me, I was like, I'm ready for this. Come on, let's have it, you know. But, you know, maybe other kids wouldn't have probably gone the other way. Being all so far away from home, not having the family support. Not my mother will love me saying this, but I actually loved, you know, being independent. Yeah. I think from when that, I went to Scotland at 14 years of age, I found that, that little bit where I liked it. I enjoyed the independent side of it. Um, and I just grew from that. And I had to learn quick. I matured very quickly just as a, as a young man, um, leaving home at such a young age and, you know, heavy responsibility on me because it's, yeah. if I don't do it, no one else is going to do it for me. So yeah. I've been pretty much built like that since yeah. you know, I have to. Uh, and that's where my control probably comes from. I, I'm very controlling about everything around me and, and, and what, it, what needs to be done. I think I've calmed that down a little bit because I can realize it now, but, Certainly, you know, in those, uh, you know, middle years of my career, it was, I had to be in control of everything all the time. So when you went, went came over, Scott, to Southampton, you would pretty much have to be self-sufficient in yourself and because you're so far from home. And did you, did you have a network around you in the UK or was it all back in, in, in Oz you had? Uh, pretty much everyone all back in Oz. Yeah. So I'm not going to say I turned up first day and everything was, was rosy, you know. Uh-huh. The first six months for me were tough. Yeah. Really tough. You know, I missed home badly. You know, I, I like I wanted to be around all my friends, you know, because you're at that, you know, middle age where you're 15, 6, 16, you're still at high school, um, all your mates are there, mm. girls, whatever else you, you mm. have in your head at that point. You know, there's, there's other things going on in your life that you're not fully – thinking about football or yeah, you're taking it seriously and all of a sudden now it's becoming a realization, you know, things can happen here, but you're missing out. You feel as if you're missing out on all those other things. So that was difficult for the first six months to get my head around. And probably I never, you know, nutted down till probably the beginning of the next season because I came midway through a season and it was embedding time. I was going out, uh, meeting new people. This new sense of independence was great from that perspective. Oh, look, you know, you're learning new things outside the game of football, but you're not really doing the things or the reasons of why you're there. So yeah. went back home, seen everyone, um, and then realised I wasn't really missing much at all. I needed to go back and take full advantage of this great opportunity that I had. Um, and the reason why my, I think, you know, my dad especially was a huge influence in me going there because um, I didn't want to go and said, son, you have to go. It's a chance of a lifetime. So many kids would be, you know, screaming out for the chance like this. So if it doesn't work out, you know, you've tried it. You can come home, but, you know, just stick it out. So in the end, stuck it out and things started to happen. You know, my form started to get better. And um, I think when things start to you know, happen on the pitch and you're working hard and you're enjoying your football, I think everything off um, off the pitch becomes a lot easier than when you're a young boy. I think sometimes that's what people forget when they look at young footballers and, you know, 16, 17, 18, because especially now, isn't it, you're, you're, you're growing up as well as learning your trade and you were so far from home as well. And uh, has, your, has your dad, was he a big influence in your football career throughout your you know, in, in the teenage years and before and through it. Absolutely. My dad was my coach um, yeah. right right from the beginning. Uh, he took our team. My dad was a decent player when he when he grew up as well. Like, he left uh, Scotland when he was 16. Um, and at that point, uh, he was in all the select sides in Isco Bribe with Ali McCoy. Okay. Because Ali's yeah. from. Yeah. Uh, I speak to Ali about it. And Ali remembers dad, funny enough. And they were always in competition against each other for the top scorers in the local leagues there. 
So my dad was decent. He played at a good level over here in Australia. So he was well, well educated within the game and his upbringing. So yeah. his coaching was fantastic for me and, and helped me a great deal. Um, and I always looked up to my dad, but it came to a point where I needed another voice. Um, it was interesting, actually, because my dad deliberately put me in a rubbish team when I was about, <laughs> uh, about 10-year-old. Yeah. And I absolutely hated him for it because I knew what he was doing. But he was trying to build a different resistance in me at that point. Yeah. Uh, back, um, Because we had it all our own way up until that point. And I was doing very well. And, and then he actually put me in a higher age group. So playing a higher age group and losing every week, it just wasn't in my DNA. I yeah. absolutely hated it. Yeah. But, um, you know, that will to win or didn't die away. And just, I suppose, I think throughout my career, it's been something that I've always uh, been proud of. I suppose the more you push me, the more I would push back. I yeah. would prove you wrong. I was, I was never going to be this guy that would accept that you were telling me that, I wasn't good enough or it wasn't going to happen for me. Yeah. I'd always come back for more and, and try and, excuse the friend, but stick it right yeah. back at you know? Um, mm. And that, that's that been my attitude in life. Uh, I'm very determined. And I think, look, I, I don't believe for a minute that I was the most talented player. I worked very, very hard. I still am working very, very hard. And I've got better over time as you do in any trade or any workplace. The more you do it, the, the better you become, the more experience you have. Um but I've always had that determination and will to work as hard as I possibly can to, to get the best out of me. And I suppose that's, that's what I say to the kids now, you know, there's no excuses for not working hard enough, you know, give yourself the best possible opportunity and chance, whether it be in football or in life by working at the extreme levels that you you can take your mind and your body to. Yeah. Cause I think it was incredibly smart what your dad did, doesn't it? At that young age to put you into the team that would really challenge you and not get your own way because, you know, we talk a lot about that in coaching now, isn't it? You know, is how far you push someone and, and yeah, having to make mistakes and get out of your comfort zone. So you learned that at a very early age, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose I did. I suppose yeah. I did. Um, you know, it wasn't all bad that time. I mean, yeah. you were just working harder. You were actually yeah. having to work harder for your rewards. Mm -hmm. um, some weeks it would work, some weeks it wouldn't. Um, and it would just frustrate me even more yeah. because I just wanted to win. I, I still am like that. Whether it's, you know, playing against my son, he's, he's on the eight, but I still don't let him win every time. Yeah. Uh, he earned the right. To, it's just, just the way I was brought up, you know. My dad never used to let me win all the time because you have to learn winning and losing, and, and it makes you come back for more, it makes you want to come back in, and next time I'm going to beat you. You know, that type of thing. And that's the type of attitude that, that I had as a kid. Um, you know, if I didn't win, I wasn't just going to throw the tally. I was like, come on, let's go now. We're going to play again right now. I'm not going to wait till tomorrow. We're going to get this done till yeah. I get it right. You know, so um, that was just, the, I, I suppose, just the way I was built. I don't know how it quite came about, but um, it was, it's just me to this day. I think when I look at, especially your early career at Southampton and, and going forward, you know, that word grit would would stand out for me because you just kept on going, didn't you? You just kept on going, learning, kind of moving forward. Did you always have it in your mind where you wanted to end up, Scott? Um, yeah, look, when I went to Southampton uh, very early on, I wanted to play in the first team mm. and I believed I was ready. Mm. I was, before I came over to Southampton, at the age of 15, I was very fortunate that I had the body. I was mm. never the biggest, but from a physicality point of view, I was ready to play mm. against men. Uh, I, I was second youngest player to play in the, the professional leagues out here, still am. Um, so I was lucky enough to play against men at, at 15 years of age. Mm. So from that, I took confidence and I never, I never thought anywhere was too good for me. Yeah. You know, I, I always felt, if I reach that level, I'm going to get better because I'm playing with better players as well. Yeah. So n nothing is limitless. You know, I was never yeah. going to be you know, at that point where I fell out of my depth. I never had that in my mm. mentality. I would keep learning, keep going, um, even if there was setbacks. Um, and I think to my uh, rewards was when I, when I went up in the first team at Southampton early on, uh, 
the respect I got from the, the senior players because I had no fear. I would mm. come in like a lot of senior players even now, and I, I, I don't like it when it happens. You know, if a young boy gets the better of them, they, they try and bully them a little bit, you know, physically, um, because they don't like a younger player getting the better of them. Whereas I really encourage that because I don't feel or see that enough anymore, um, that fearlessness within young players. And you want that from when they step up, yeah. that they're ready. They, they're hungry. They want your position. You know, and I think that's such a healthy thing that they come with that, um, ad, you know, attitude and, uh, mentality because it's it's very rare now because people when they come into new environments it, it takes them a little bit of time to to find their feet and they want to get to know the you know the situation within the group and, and the environment that they're in and um they're not quite sure if they can come across that way whereas you, you'll get the rare ones that come in and go right bang yeah. you know this is mine i'm here for a reason and everyone just could wall and some will go oh, i'm gonna knock him down a peg Whereas sometimes, no, you need to go the other way with it. You know, you need to let them flourish. And every now and again, you, you need to speak to them and tone it down because there will be time because they're young and they're learning. They might make mistakes. But I, I think that's something where you've got to let them go. You've got to let them learn and make the mistakes for themselves. I think that's a great point, Scott, especially, you know, at a, a higher youth level or coming through, which, which you said, you know, it is actually 16, 17, 18. You're, you're, you can be playing senior level if you're, good enough and it's the paradox isn't it is you don't if you have an opportunity you have to take it because you're not going to get a lot of time really yeah mm. exactly and I, I say to the boys um you know when they come up and train make me remember you today don't be just another guy that was out here today stand out do something show me something you know make people remember that you were out there today because mm. that's why you came up because they believe you you can do it Mm -hmm. right so because you're doing it at your own level so why can't you do it here so mm -hmm. don't be shy about it get involved and make the manager be in the manager's face make him mm -hmm. see you for all the right things and be memorable always be memorable in what you do try and be memorable you know and that's Love that try to be memorable see coming back we're talking about scotland a little bit do you, do you think in the scottish culture that is encouraged enough you know that thing because i always think that thing about you better keep your head underneath the parapet, uh, you know, a bit too much. Uh, don't get too big for your boots. Do you think that's still around or is it changing in Scotland a bit? Uh, I think it's changing a little bit. Mm. I still think within uh, football DNA, it's there, mm. regardless of what country you're in. Still, it's still here as well in Australia. Yeah. So you still get that old hierarchy thing. You know, I remember young boys would get to the front pre-season and they would get torn apart and they'd yeah. be threatened. <laughs> you go by me again. As soon as we get their change, you're going to get it. You better stay right at the back. You know, and all of a sudden you see everyone just stay all back. You know, so you, you will have a bit of, not as, it's not as, uh, as harsh as what it used to be yeah. without question. That's yeah. just the way society's gone. And yeah. those, you know, being a, a young sort of, uh, you know, learner, trainee, um, and all the hard times that you had to go through that, that yeah. things have evolved and changed and probably for the better, you know, yeah. some of the things that probably went on probably can't be spoken. About. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but it was part of the learning curve and the, the yeah. discipline that, that, that you had to learn. And, you know, some of the things were, gave you good values um, without question. So what would you, you know, in, in your career, playing career, what coaches had the biggest influence in, in you? I think um, my first one would probably be um, a South American guy who um, was my coach in, in Australia when I was 15. He converted me into a centre forward. Before right. that, I was uh, a winger, yeah. uh, a right winger. And I came into his team and he said, no, you're a centre forward. The way your style is, the way you play. He sort of looked upon me as this type of South American type of player. And yeah. he taught me so much in such a short space of time. He was my coach for probably about a year and a half. Mm. And um, Daniele Espinosa was his name. And being South American, like <laughs> you can imagine, you're 15 um, and he's teaching you all these things that, oh, let's be real, the South yeah. Americans all these things. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the naughty side of the game, the, yeah. 
trying to give you edges here and there. Um, and that's part of their edge. I talk about yeah. Australia's, but South Americans have their own playbook with it. Yeah. Um, and you would get insight to that as yeah. well. So um, I suppose I wasn't always um, the honest, nice yeah. you know, player. Um, I had an edge about me. Yeah. Um, you know, I think even to this day, I, I still have that. And, and that was another reason why I think um, I was able to be successful because I had a little bit of edge. I never crossed the line. I mean, mm. I think I was sent off twice in my career mm. and they weren't for anything naughty, um, so to speak. But um, I knew how to try and manipulate the rules a little bit, <laughs> yeah. so to speak. I, I tried to push it to the edge. Um, I think that's the way all Australians always are. We watch the cricket, you know, yeah. my goodness but they went over it recently. Um, but, yeah, he was probably the first one that really influenced me. But we're talking from a professional level. There's, yeah. there's only one guy I could really say that had the utmost and for good and for bad was Gordon Strachan. Right. Um, real testing times. I mean, I've had Gordon at three different clubs and release me and, and sign me and, and then re-sign me again at, at another club. So I went full circle um, over probably now – it's been seventeen year period with oh. Gordon, you know, and um, he's certainly a guy that's more than a fatherly figure to me. Yeah. I, I look up to now. Uh, don't get me wrong; at eighteen, nineteen, I hated him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for releasing me because I, I, I just didn't believe that that was the right decision, um, yeah. and I always had that in my head. And I, I guess I always say to young people, don't blame others. You know. Yeah. Um, you've got to move on and, and, and look and, and press on to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But I suppose at that point, um, at 18 or 19, I used it at motivation um, that Gordon had felt that I wasn't good enough. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I'd made the first team at Southampton, he had come in, the club was in relegation trouble. Um, and then he went more senior route, which was fair enough. You, you, as you get older, you learn the game and you need results straight away. You need to survive. That's why he was brought in as a manager. And through that, I really, really struggled from the heights of playing in the, you know, getting my debut in the Premier League to then going back to the start again. I just didn't know where to begin with it. I, yeah. All the hard work that got me there, then to be back down the hill again, mm. I just wasn't ready for that. I wasn't mm. ready to, to then drive back up the hill again. Mm. I just didn't know how to do it. Um, and it took me a good while. And confidence-wise as well, um, I'd have to say that, leaving Southampton and the things that happened up to that period to Motherwell were, you know, probably the lowest parts of my career, hundred percent, because it was so up and down and unknown. I was living, you know, with my now wife's family um, because I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to go back to Australia. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to keep going. So I ended up going to Bournemouth. Then we got promoted, played, uh, you know, got in the player final. We got promoted from there, got promised a contract didn't end up coming. I was waiting for three months, agents on the phone, this, that, and X, still waiting. And it was just like, what am I doing? I'm sitting at my, my now in-laws house, you know, a million miles away from my family going, what's going on? And I got a Wimbledon on a month to month contract, uh, traveling all the way from Southampton to, yeah. to London every day, traffic, name it. Then, um, absolutely hating it yeah. and thinking, right, what are we going to do now? Right. This isn't working out. They said the same moving on again um, and I get to probably about the January time in that year and I'm thinking right, I'm going home mm -hmm. I just got to go home I've got to restart and have support for me um, and people that believe in me because I, I'm just I feel like I'm so alone now um, so I was this this close like I mean day maybe two of yeah. going home and then got the phone call from Dave McPherson obviously yeah. X-Rangers mm -hmm. Hearts player who's now an agent um and working with a, an australian agent at the time Lou sticker and saying right come up to to mother mm -hmm. they want to have it here and i was uh, i said no i was like no nah, i'm not doing it because i had had so much negative stuff going on i got to that point now where i was almost ready to just go nah i, I need to go back to somewhere where i feel someone's gonna believe in me mm -hmm. i lacked i just felt I never stopped believing in myself for some reason. I, I felt, you know, I was good enough, but I wasn't getting the break. Yeah. You know, if you get all that blame if you want, but, you know, I suppose in luck, uh, I suppose in football, 
it's right place, right time for, for, for some individuals. You know, I think you need to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, something has to happen or there's an injury in a club or, um, you know, there's a place, a position that a club needs to fill. You know, and, uh, and that was certainly the case at, at Motherwell. You know, going up there within two days, I managed to impress enough um, to, for Terry to sign me, Terry mm-hmm. Butcher. Um, and I talk about influences. I think Terry probably is huge, another one, huge influence yeah. because – uh, he was the guy who believed in me. He was the guy who put his arm around me and said, you're good enough. I believe in you. That's why we signed you. Go and play. Just go and do your thing. Like, didn't put any restrictions on me and just went, go and play. My God, did I just, boom, it just took off. Um, I guess they say the rest is history after that um, yeah. in terms of just strength, strength. But I was just looking for that one person just to give me that belief, yeah. give me the, the release that I needed to, to go and flourish. I think there's a lot of people, a lot, yeah. a lot of players out there that, that you look at and probably just need that one person, you know, to, to go and unlock the, you know, put that key in the lock and, and unlock it for them. I think that's a you know, really powerful part of your story, Scott, which you, you know is, you know, what there, a lot of people will say, you know, everything's learning and, you know, there's no such thing as kind of mistakes. You get back up again. But what they, they miss a lot is when things are tough, it feels shit. <laughs> so you, yeah. you you kept on going, you know, as you say, how how close you were to coming back to getting that almost a kind of, um, you know, being around people that believed in you again. But you kept on in the game, you kept on the pitch and you got that move that was, was great for you. And I think that's such a powerful lesson for a lot of people there that you just kept on going, you know, you kept on. That's that grit from your younger days as well, isn't it? If you weren't yeah. self-sufficient, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do that. I know you had people around you, but if you didn't have that belief. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's been great. It's been great in terms of my football career. Um, but in terms of sometimes as a person, can get in the way, you know, yeah. being a human you know, so I've, I've certainly learned that a lot as I've got older, that um, some of those traits need to be sometimes locked away, you know, yeah, because yeah. You, you need to, you, I probably lacked a lot of empathy at, at times, Donald, mm-hmm. you know, within those younger years of my career. And I think that was something Gordon touched on a lot when I signed for Celtic again, was that he seen me as a, as a better teammate, as a better person, the way I worked and the way I played at Motherwell compared to probably what I was at Southampton. And, and that's what triggered him and um, made him sign me again because of those types of signs that he's seen. Um, okay. So, you know, you, you, you learn. But even thereafter that, there's, there's things in, you know, in my, my own family life that, you know, you realise that you have to shut off. Some of those things that make you successful are cold and uh, negative within your own you know, the way you live and the way you speak to people, the way you talk to people, the way you bring your children up, you know. So you, you have to, you're always evolving, so yeah. to speak, yeah. as, a, as a person. Um, and I've certainly done that. And I think having, you know, my children is, uh, has been a huge life lesson and, and, and made me a lot softer, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, I think that I think that's a great description, Scott, what you've just given of of you know, some of the key traits of a high-performance athlete, you know, you need that in order to get to the top, in order to get your goals. You need that self-sufficiency, that drive, that almost obsession. But for most people, it is very difficult to just switch that off in different contexts, isn't it? And uh, I I always struggled with that, you know, early on. I was very numb to it. Um, And more or less was hardened too much and didn't want to change off yeah. because I seen that that was my way of life. You've got to remember from the age of 15, I've moved over and my one target is, is that yeah. it's just that. So yeah. all the other things out, out with football were, were secondary. Yeah. You know, it was always eye on the prize, eye on the prize, yeah. eye on the prize. As you get older, you learn to relax a little bit more. Um, yeah. Probably leaving once I left Celtic, that certainly eased off a lot more as well. But again, my children were born when we went down mm-hmm. to Middlesbrough, and made me see other things that were important in life as well mm-hmm. as just your football. 
and, and your attitude of when things weren't going your way, there was other things to, to help you get through it. See, when, you, when your talk is, what did you feel settled anywhere? I don't mean at a club in a place, you know, that you, you said, oh, right, I'm here, I can put down my roots here. Or, or was it always um, a feeling of, I suppose what I'm saying is, did you ever feel at home anywhere you, you went? Or was it always it's great, Australia? It's a great question. And, and me and my wife still talk about this and we're still trying to figure this out. We're, we're so nomadic. Mm. The closest thing we've ever come to is obviously living in Glasgow. We're 14 mm. years on and off. We have so many friends for life and, and family members. We call family now um, throughout that period. So it's it's been a difficult process coming here and obviously with COVID and everything else. And then I've had to move twice football clubs within a season and, and leave, moving the kids and the wife and, and my wife, Claire, again. It's uh, not been a popular choice, but thankfully we're, we're now at the point now where we're trying to you know build things and just build blocks. Um, but I suppose Glasgow is probably the closest thing we could call that. But it's a difficult one because we're still searching for it. And that's that's a, a hard thing as well um, when you haven't got a place to call home. Yeah. You know? And um, it can be mentally very fatiguing at times. And um, you haven't got that that safe place yeah. you know, type of thing where, well, when everything's going bad, that's that's where you go to. You know, that's that, that's the safe house, isn't it? Yeah, so totally. I suppose the first thing we had to that was was living in Glasgow. And how have you? Because I think how has your experience as as a player and and you know all the amazing experiences you had and also the hard times? How has that influenced you as a coach going into the coaching world? Um, good question. I, I think for me now, I think the best thing that ever happened to me was retiring the first time around, because I felt, uh, I was talking to you off before yeah. off camera, was um, the whole process, and like we pretty much people were yeah. getting by this, was the whole process was single-mindedness. You know, mm. It was about me, the process of what I needed to do to get what I needed. Mm. Um, and I never stopped thinking that way through that whole period up until I retired. It was all about Scott McDonald. The ego as well, and what what the ego needed, and what people were going to see of Scott McDonald, and the numbers he needed to get to, the performances, you know. And if you weren't getting it, it started to, again. It wasn't your fault; it's his fault, that fault, da da da. And you become a little bit disconnected mm. from everyone around you. Um, and, and I'd be, I was very, very guilty of that um, the last couple of seasons, especially because. I, I put it to people like this, you know, out with footballers who understand what I'm saying here, but it's one of the, you know, being a sports man or a sports woman, one of the most difficult things as you're getting older to the end of your career, because it's one of the only jobs in the world where you get better at it. You get more experience as you get older, but you go further down the ladder. You yeah. don't go up it. Yeah. You know? So and dealing with that as you're getting older and you're not worth as much money, maybe financially you're not getting the rewards you once were, but also the level that you're playing at as well, you still feel that you always should be there and you're playing maybe there. So you, you're dealing with all those difficulties as, you, as you're getting on. I mean, there will be the exceptional ones that can stay there and, and, and reach that bar for a long period of time. And one of my coaches, I won't name him, has always said that if you want to play for a long time, you, you've got to play at the highest levels because the players around you make it so much yeah. easier to enjoy it and play within that. I suppose it depends on your personality, Donald, yeah. but I think it was pretty much right for, for majority on that. Yeah. Um, and if I had have kept going, well, that's why I retired because yeah. I just couldn't do it. Anymore. I couldn't deal with it um, for, for me. And I was frustrated within myself and I didn't give enough to the other players around me. For my experience, for what I achieved, um, and for what I'd done at those later on moments in my career, the you know back at the Motherwalls and the part, um, sorry before Partick Thistle, Dundee United, um, I should have probably been there a lot more for the younger players. Mm. I mean, but okay, you, you you're, you're still looking about you and your process. But um, the opportunity came up to come to Australia, mm. um, which I was 
you know, so desperate to do in the first place because I had an opportunity a couple of years before that and it never worked out. So me and the family were really excited about the, the proposition of going. So I had to go again and improve my fitness, which meant going back to Partick Thistle with Gary Caldwell. And um, I went in there with no expectation, no pressure, and just me to go in, get fit, and enjoy football and actually yeah. help Gary um, and help the team achieve the goal, which was to save off from relegation. They were in the bottom, were bottom of the league at the time. So I came in with this positive, fresh mindset and gave all of me to pretty much everyone else. I was there to help the manager, to help all the players, probably to go between for Gary and, uh, and Brian Kerr at the time and, and be that bridge with the players. But also, I think, with my qualities, um, help and improve the team. So um, being there for the other players and the reward I got from, from them, actually, because they were buying into me, I realised then that, my, my goodness, my performances were getting better as well. Yeah. You know, you were giving more to them and you were seeing the benefit for them, but you were also getting that as well. So um, from that, I've taken a lot uh, moving forward um, since I've came to Australia as well. And the rewards that I've had thus far, I mean, because of your experiences and, and what you've done, um, I've been very fortunate through all those highs and lows, like yeah. you say, um, and playing at different levels within the game. And actually, probably later on in my career, I played different positions as well. So I had to adapt. Um, the game changed. The game evolved. Yeah. Didn't have two strikers anymore. Uh, big man, small man, had to play centre midfield, had to play in you know attack and midfield role or a wide role. So you're learning all these different areas of the pitch and playing different parts of the game. So that's helped me in terms of my, uh, you know, being a coach as well, um, seeing different pitches and yeah. being able to help different players as well um, with that. Um, because you don't realise until you actually get in those roles how hard it can be for them to actually get that ball where you wanted it when you were playing as a striker. Um, so, you know, through all those experience, I think that's helped me now. Uh, and I think that's made me, well, most definitely a better coach now than what I would have been if I had have just gone into it um, after, you know, retiring the first time. I think I would have found it very difficult to attach myself to players mm -hmm. and would have frust been frustrated if players couldn't do what I was probably telling them. Whereas there's a process now uh, you, you go through and um, not just the arm around the shoulder like people talk about, but yeah. I think we've talked about it a lot, that those softer skills that you need to yeah. have in terms of your way of communicating yeah. with people because yeah. that's what they are. They're people first, you know, players second in yeah. my eyes. So, yeah. so we have to communicate on those levels to get the very best. Um, yeah. You've got to understand that and you've got to speak to people the way you would like to be spoken to. Do you think when you're looking now, and I know you're still playing, Scott, I actually, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about when you were younger playing wide, I'm sure I've seen you scoring a great goal a few months ago when you cut in from the right and made some space twice and <laughs> slotted it home. I'm glad you mentioned that one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah so I'm still rolling back the years at the moment and I take real pride in I talked about, you know, working hard. And I think... Um, I think as I got a little bit older, I wasn't probably as educated when I was at Celtic. Um, and looking back, there's two ways of looking at it. Uh, my body shape and the way I was yeah. um, helped me or defined me as the player I was at probably at Celtic. Mm. But the longevity I've had is due to changing the way my body shape was and, and actually being more educated and uh, looking after my body in a different way mm. and, and being a lot fitter and leaner. Um, to what I was then, but it had it's, it's, it had more advantages in terms of the style of play I was playing at that point. Yeah. Um, but my longevity is due to actually flipping that Adopted. and changing that, and um, and being a lot fitter now um, to survive basically, and it still still run the legs off some of these young boys. Do you notice then, Scott, when you as you're moving into the coaching, and sometimes I think it's quite a difficult quick to, question to answer, but. Do you, but we'll talk about it a lot. Do you think the young players now have changed compared to when you were playing in terms of their attitude or how they approach the game or anything like that? Yeah, I, I think with, without question, um, I think in society, I think 
their lifestyles have changed. It's a lot easier to access everything, to be given everything. I'm not saying it, everyone's as fortunate as that, mm. um, but but certainly um, culturally now it's changed. But you have to adapt to that. Yeah. So it's not about, I don't like um, when we talk about, well, when I was your oh. age and because we're not living in that age anymore. We're, yeah. we're living in, in 2020. So yeah. we, we have to learn and understand what these young people are thinking. And mm. I think, I guess now there's more, I suppose because we have so much internet, social media mm. and, and thought process about it. There's a lot of negativity in the world. Mm. You know, there's far more out there for you yeah. to, to grab and see whether it's as a player, or, you know, or a coach doesn't matter, you know, with these social media outlets, see all these things and then the fears that are out there from that mm -hmm. so i think as a coach you have to understand that and i think it never changed from when i was had my biggest success and what gordon was able to do with us and i, and I really feel you have to do this with young players especially yeah. now we almost have to put a safety net over them you know we had this protective bubble when we were at celtic almost that couldn't be penetrated that's how it felt as a player and the manager always always no matter what protected us from the outside world you know someone could poke it could stab it it was never going to get burst because he made sure it was never going to be done because he was always there and he had our backs if he had a bad game he'd tell everyone we had a good game you know but he'd be telling us inside that bubble exactly what he thought yeah but no one else out of the bubble didn't really need to know you know as long as it was in there now that's easier said than done yeah you know that's a big challenge in any environment to be able to even bring that environment uh into you know uh, a sporting one yeah. um and it's special if you get it and you can grab it and these players within that feel that then they'll free up they'll become more themselves and their personalities will come out and shine through as well because they know that they can one they've still got obviously the fundamentals or the values and the cultures of what me as a coach or the manager wants. Um, and if you give that, then the mistakes you make, they are fine. You know, if, you, if you're not meeting those cultures and values are along the way with it, then that's when there will be a problem within that bubble. Yeah. But if you're doing all the right things within it and you're making mistakes, that's fine. That's how we learn. How else do we learn? Uh, again, let me talk about going back to what my father did. I don't suppose you're going to learn by, by winning 10 nil every week. No, you know, you have to be challenged in life, no matter what you do and try and do that as much as possible with my own children. Because if they're not put in those situations, then I don't know how, how you learn. If, yeah. if everything's great in the world and you tell them it is all the time, then they're going to think that that's just a normal all the time. And then they're not going to have that till that challenge comes and all of a sudden it's too late. They get it so a lot later in life and then they don't know how to fix it they've not had any experience yeah. to, to understand how to go through the process to to understand it or to fix it i think you're right so when you look going forward this goes what's your what's your goals for yourself going forward in the game i know it's a that's a big question but i think i'm just as ambitious as what i was as a player mm. uh, i look at it now and I probably, I lost confidence as I got older, as a player. Mm. I, I actually I got a lot more. And I think it's funny, I, someone else talked about this uh, recently. I think it was on, on the pro license. And yeah. talking about young players fearless. Yeah. The more you have the issue with the senior player, I, I, it might have been Jesse even, just yeah. not, but you have more issues with the senior players because they're getting older and there's more negativity in their thought process. Yeah. And the things that they've learned already, they're not as willing to learn new things. So if yeah. the old things aren't working anymore, they don't know how to fix it type of thing. Yeah. We're talking about younger, but as you get older too. So the negative the negative mindset. But I suppose because I'm fresh and I'm young yeah. uh, in terms of coaching and managing, yeah. I'm at that fearless stage you know, in, the, in that career and the sky's the limit. Uh, yeah. But again, it's not like you can just turn up and it's, it's going to happen for you. It's yeah. like anything. You have to really work hard and learn. Um, and I've learned such a, a massive amount in such a small space of time. Um, yeah. Once you put yourself out there and you put yourself right in the middle of it, um, I think that's the only way you learn. Yeah. Um, you're just getting it head on as oh, much yeah. as possible. And Brisbane has been amazing for me uh, coming to this football club and they've gave me 
you know, a full, you know, free leeway to go, right, there you go, go and learn, go in the academy, go with the reserves, um, come and help us, you know, within the first team structure with strikers um, and, and just put as many sessions on as possible and get yourself out there on match days and, and, and take as much in as possible and learn off the other coaches that are there as well. And that's, a, that's another thing I would say as well, Donna. Like, I think when I was a little bit younger, it's like football people, like, you know, like footballers are the only ones that know because they played the game and yeah. this and that. Again, nonsense. You know, you're, yeah. there's so much to learn off. Everyone has different experiences yeah. within the game. You don't need to have played it. And that's the beauty now that you're, you're working with people in, in – in Brisbane Rural Academy that not a lot of people probably heard of them, but you know, there's so much for me to learn off these people and off their experiences. And I'm learning that now, you know, more than ever that, you know, to pick the brains of, of everyone that's in it, that everyone has a story, like yeah. we say, and um, has their own experiences. So yeah. the, the more you can sponge it, the better you're going to become. That's brilliant, Scott. I think that's a, a great message for anyone, you know, in, in really any field, isn't it? It's, work hard and learn and everyone has a story you know there's you can't go wrong with that so uh, I really appreciate you taking the the time to speak to me today and that's been great because I know how busy you are over there as well and uh, so thanks very much Scott no worries Donald keep enjoying that sunny Scotland (laughs) (laughs) I knew that was coming out (laughs) see you Scott cheers